what's there to talk about music? And what, do, what can I say about music anyway? Well, I'm not a producer of music, but I'm a connoisseur of music. And music has two amazing attributes amongst many. One of them is that when two people talk at the same time, it's interruption. And when two people sing at the same time, it's harmony. <laughs> It's a big deal. Think about it. Number two, you can listen to a shear once, twice, maybe even three times if you're lucky. A song, the song I just played for you, which is a, a magnificent song, um, I've heard that already a dozen times and I can hear it a dozen more. It's just a magnificent piece of music. You could listen over and over and over. Song takes us to a, a space, whatever kind of song it is, whatever talks your fancy, rock, pop, country, Israeli, etc. Music takes you if you allow it to. And it, it just takes you from a space of this world and takes you to a different place. And what's fascinating is that if I said the same words without music, it's okay. You could listen to a poem once, twice, three times, but the second I bring music to the poetry, it transforms you. It takes you to a different location. Something about notes and bringing a melodious tone to the music, to the words, transforms it. And they've shown in people who stutter, often when they sing, they don't stutter. So they often train people who have a stuttering problem to sing their way through music, through their sentences. So instead of saying, I wanna to go to the store, which might cause them to stutter, they'll say, I want to go to the store. They'll make a melody out of it, they'll make a tune out of it, and that will allow them to not stutter. Somehow when you go into the realm of music, you go into a place that's much less limited. Music gets us to dance, music gets us to cry, music gets us to, to move. Sometimes I wish that Hashem chose me to be a musician rather than a rabbi because then all you have to do is sing the same song. You don't have to come up with a new speech each time. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, yeah, there, there, there is that um, alter ego that wishes they, they, I went into music. It just has an incredible power. But today I wanna to talk to you specifically about the power of a real Jewish melody. I mean, I'm sure you have your favorite singers, your favorite composer, your favorite writers, but I wanna talk specifically about Jewish music. And when I talk about Jewish music, I'm not even talking about the music I just played for you or Shweki. I'm talking about real traditional Jewish music whether it is the music of the Siddur, the music of Rosh Hashanah, whether it's a Friday night song, Zmirot around the table, whether it's an ancient Hasidic melody, the real Jewish music. Today, often what Jewish music is, is a Jewish person composed it. So Bob Dylan is Jewish music. But, or if a from person composed the music, then it must be, you know, Jewish. But true music, comes from the deepest part of, an, of a soul. It's an expression of a soul. As it says, Nigina song is the kulmos hanefesh, it's the pen of the soul. Literally, that's the way the soul talks. So if a, a, a person composes a nice song, but they're not a deep person, they're not a deeply spiritual person, so then they're expressing themselves in song, but okay, they happen to you know have a talent. They happen to have a knack to choose good rhymes. They have a knack to choose a catchy tune. They, you know, they, they just have it. But just because you have it musically doesn't mean you have it solely. And Jewish music in its purest form is the stuff that really transforms you. So for example, you come to Sholem Rosh Hashanah. 
and you listen to the tune. That tune is hundreds and hundreds of years old, and it's said in pretty much every shul around the world. And that is a tune that came from the Jewish neshama, was accepted by the Jewish neshama, and for hundreds and hundreds of years has become part and parcel of who we are. That is the music that truly transforms. That's the music that truly changes you. Even when you come to show on Friday night, yes, there's some songs that are more modern. There's a Kalbach song. You know, in our show, we'll often do songs that don't really come from a Jewish source. But then there is a Kaddish that comes directly from hundreds of years tradition. And now you think that big deal, the chazan's getting up, humming a tune. No, this is stuff that's been who we are. And this is the stuff that I think we have to learn to appreciate more. And I'll tell you why. Some of the moments that are truly going to change your life are the moments of deep reflection. And there is nothing that could bring you to reflection like good music. And the question is, what kind of reflection do you want to achieve? If you want to achieve reflection from the purest source, then you have to listen to pure music. Years ago, before I joined Linksfield Show, I, I used to... Uh, when I was still trying to find myself here in South Africa. So I, I was in Torah Academy, Shul, by my father-in-law, I used to daven there. And they have a tradition, it's an ancient Hasidic tradition, that Shabbos afternoon, between mid, the afternoon service and the evening service, to Mincha Mayrev, they sing Hasidic melodies. And it was my privilege to be able to lead it. So each week, I did this for three, four years. Shabbos afternoon, let's say 5.30, 6.30 in the afternoon, depending on the time of the year, we'd sit down for 40 minutes, sitting and singing Hasidic melodies. I miss it dearly. Why? Because there you are, you're sitting with a bunch of people. I would try to sing tunes that at least a few of them were familiar with. So there is, you know, there's a lot of tunes that are maybe a bit unknown, but there's tunes that the crowd was familiar with. And everyone's closing their eyes. And often you ch I would choose tunes that don't have words because even amongst Jewish melodies, words can often, you know, limit the, the, the song because it's only confined to those words. But then there is a tune that truly without words takes you to places. I know that this is not what you guys signed up for, but this is where I'm in, in the zone. So you'll forgive me if I'll sing you one of those tunes that really touches me without words. And what I'm, what I'm hoping I could give you an appreciation in today's class is that sometimes words limit. And, and sometimes when you allow things, um, when you allow, when you allow the tune to enter you, it will truly transform you. So this is a tune that goes back about 200 years, 250 years. And it describes a person getting ready to be honest with themselves. So it's a song of honesty, where they're willing to look up and face themselves. It goes like this. I don't know if my voice is sounding good today, but I'm in the mood of singing a Hasidic melody, so forgive me. Da, da, da. Da 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 
First of all, because I love a good song, but more importantly, because that song tells me more than three hours of drushes. It takes me to a space where I'm absolutely at my most peaceful clarity, most peaceful clarity. Earlier today, I was asking myself, I said, what is the biggest curse of Corona? What is the biggest challenge that Corona gave us? And you know what I think it is? Clarity. We don't have clarity. We have no idea what. Each and every one of us, should I go out of the house? Should I go to this place? Should I not go to this place? What decisions to make? What's right? What's wrong? How rigid? How flexible, how open-minded should I be? How close-minded should I be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have tons and tons of questions. And nobody offers clarity because the medical community is learning in each day. So for example, today we had the sad news that they had to stop putting out the vaccine from England um, because it seems to not be working against the South African variant, at least partially. We don't know. And living in a place of lack of knowledge, living in a place of lack of clarity can really boggle the person, can really put us down. 
And therefore, there has to be moments in our lives of clarity. When I mean clarity, it doesn't mean that now, after I sing a melody or after I go to a great cheer, I know the answer to COVID. But at that moment, I'm not bothered by COVID. At that moment, I'm living in a world of truth. And for those few select moments, I'm at peace. My lack of clarity does not get to me. Some of us think it's a mitzvah to watch the news every single day and be updated about the news every single day and know exactly what's going on all day, every day on WhatsApp, on our internet, on et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the issue. When you're constantly plugged in, you're never plugged into yourself. Once you're constantly plugged into the news, to the phone, to the universe, when you're constantly connected to, sorry, to this, to whatever else is going on, you're, you're not connected to yourself, to your inner most beautiful self. How does the expression go? I'd rather be in with myself and out with others than out with myself and in with others. And I would say the same thing about news. Our inner world is rich. Each human being has an inner rich world. And that world is covered with music and writing and obviously Yiddishkeit and faith and love and connection both to people alive and to those who passed. That's our inner rich world. But how much time are we spending with that world? Yes, we're a lot alone, we're alone. But we're alone and we have Netflix and we're alone and we have a phone and we're alone and we have distractions, the news cycle, the television. So you could be alone and totally not alone. In other words, today we're lonely, but we're not alone. We're lonely because the TV doesn't offer you companionship. The TV doesn't offer you friendship. We're lonely because we're not getting enough bonding with people, but we're not alone. I have this next to me all the time. I have my computer, I have my internet, I have my TV, I have my you know, my ability to connect to the news cycle, the newspaper, whatever I'm engaged in, I am not alone, but I'm lonely. But there's nothing wrong with being alone. There's something very wrong with being lonely. And yes, some of what COVID does, we can't really do anything about. The loneliness is the loneliness, it just is. But why to be alone? Why not be alone, I mean? because alone is a good thing. Loneliness is terrible. Alone is great. There's an ancient Hasidic saying that says, it's good to be alone even amongst people. And what it means is not that you shouldn't have friends, but you should not lose your own rich inner self amongst other people. You should still have your own aloneness, not loneliness, aloneness. There is enough richness in our mind, in our heart, and in our soul to keep us inspired and motivated and connected, even in this difficult time. And I think more than ever, we have to tap into it. Unfortunately, in the last few days, I've heard of a lot, a lot of divorces and family chaos due to COVID, people being stuck under the same roof. And I get it, you know, Matt, COVID is exasperating marriages that never were a great fit. It's exasperating it. Marriages that maybe were never like, you know, perfect and everybody managed to create distance. Now there's no distance. I get it. But if we're in lockdown with each other, it doesn't mean we can't be alone. If each and every one of us in our own home and our own space is still getting our own rich world, then we won't be down each other's necks. Fact is, we are going to be in some semi form of lockdown for a very long time. And yes, we maybe have to learn how to live with the people we are, but more than that, we have to learn how to live with ourselves. I'm talking to myself because I know how tempting it is the moment I have a free moment to check the phone, to check the news, to check WhatsApp, to be able to just be, not to go to sleep, 
I mean, obviously there's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself and sleeping and eating, but just reflecting, listening to a beautiful piece of music, listening to a beautiful poem, reading something that deeply inspires you or tapping into your own inner world, your memories, your story, your family history, your legacy. That's what sustains us. But we're not doing it. I think, you know, people have said that technology has made COVID bearable because imagine doing lockdown without technology. And it's true. I mean, we're able to, I'm sitting on Zoom. I have to be grateful for that. But technology has also made us lose so much of what COVID has to offer. Because imagine having COVID and lockdown and then being forced to go inwards. You know how rich that is? We don't spend enough time with ourselves. For me, what music does, when I did that music, for those five minutes, I was on a different planet. I closed my eyes. I wasn't looking on you know, the group. I wasn't looking who's here, who's not here. For that few minutes, music does that for me. It just takes me to that space. What's your, what's your zone? What's your thing that takes you to the softest and most pure and innocent part of yourself? Go there. Go there. It's going to nourish you. It's going to nourish you. We need nourishment, and the nourishment cannot come only from another good meal or another Zoom sheer or another venting session with your friend, which is all good. It has to come from ourselves, but we're not spending time with ourselves. We're like a foreigner to ourselves. It's like, hello, how are you? I always say, why do you expect people to enjoy your company if you don't enjoy your own? She's not my friend. Well, you're not either your friends. Why should she like you? She finds me boring. Well, you also find you boring. My husband doesn't listen to me. You don't need to listen to you. Why should anybody find me interesting if I can't find myself interesting? Why should anybody enjoy my company if I can't enjoy my own company? It's sad because it's true. We often get very hurt by other people not liking us, but we don't realize how little often, not everybody, how often we don't like ourselves that much. You know, the mitzvah, love a fellow as yourself. There was one wise person who said, please love other people more than you love yourself. Because if you love people the way you love yourself, it's not going to be much of a love. Tell me, who do you love more, your children or yourself? And if you have a good marriage, who do you love more, your spouse or yourself? Your parents or yourself? It's hard to love oneself. But you know why? One of the reasons is millions of reasons. One of the reasons is because we know ourselves less than we know anybody else. You could give me a straight analysis about your husband, everything about him. You could analyze each of your children down to a science. But what about analyzing you? What excites you? Who are you? That's a hard journey. And COVID should be the opportunity for us to do it. We're starting year two of COVID very soon. You know, year two of this craziness. So we've already been, we're pros in this. You know, we've survived a full year of this madness. We're pros. So now we're going to have another year of this, another year of Zooms, and another year of, you know, waiting for the vaccine to come, and another year of praying that we'll be able to come back to Shulman or praying that we'll never have to go back. <laughs> like, I'm starting to wonder if people actually want to come back. Are they like, okay, please, like, you know, we're actually quite comfortable not coming to Shul. So please, Rabbi, just get off our case and we hope that Shuls don't open up. Whichever one, we can't just be in a waiting room. You know, when uh, in the firm world, once boys and girls enter a stage of shidduchim, of getting married, so, you know, some people it works smoothly and sometimes it doesn't. You don't exactly get set up with the right person very quickly. So it's called the waiting room. It's like a kind of a joke, but like, you know, she's, you know, she's 21, she's entered the waiting room. He's 23, they've entered the waiting room. 
And now the question is how long they're in the waiting room. The problem is very often, if it takes a while, the boy and girl kind of freeze because they're, they, they, don't want, they don't want to make the next big decision of their life, career, et cetera, because you know, I, I'm not married yet. I haven't really settled down. So you enter this kind of limbo stage, which is very uncomfortable. Um, some people do end up making the decisions. The point is like that waiting room is like when you're just sitting, I always like, let me give a worse example. Like most South Africans who live in South Africa, they're always in the waiting room. They're one step away from emigrating. Yeah, kind of, but however, I was turning, I was talking to a rabbi earlier today. I haven't spoken about this, my favorite topic in a while. I was talking to a rabbi earlier today. I said, you know what? I haven't heard for a while people talking about corruption. Not that there's no corruption, but it's not the big topic. And yet I'm hearing more people emigrating than ever before. So what's the new excuse? I always said that every decade has its excuse. So thank God we finished with 2020, 2020's excuse is over. So now South Africans have come up with a new reason to emigrate, but there's always a good reason. And this goes back to the fifties. Pretty much it goes back since South Africa was at its heyday, it went straight down. 50 years ago, when Chabad came here, they were already told, why are you coming to a dying community? That's in the early seventies. Pretty much this community, a lot of it, it's always been, a, you know, sitting in a waiting room. And you know how terrible it is to be in a waiting room. Well, COVID is also starting to become a bit of a waiting room. And you cannot live in a waiting room long term. You can live in it in a month, two months. At some stage, as I always say, if you sit on the fence, your clothing get ripped. You can't sit on the fence. You have to decide. You have to take this bull by the horns and, and make the best of it whether it's living in South Africa, whether it's in COVID and going into your inner rich world, whatever it is, but this idea of just sitting and like, eh, 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 eh. doubt is the killer. It's a killer. We're told even when it comes to sickness, sometimes hearing a terrible prognosis is worse than the doubt, is better than the doubt that comes before it because the doubt is much worse than the knowledge. And yes, as I said earlier, we're struggling with clarity in this time. We're struggling with, during COVID with clarity, but that doesn't mean that we cannot get some clarity and that clarity will come if we tap into our inner rich world. If we go in, go into a place of peace, go to your happy place. Once upon a time, a happy place meant a, a place in the garden, a diary, a music. It's still there. COVID hasn't taken any of that away from us. It's taken a lot, but it's not taken our inner rich world away from us. And the question that we're going to ask ourselves after COVID is over is, did I just sit in the waiting room for two years, three years, whatever, 18 months? Or did I actually use this opportunity where so much was taken away from me to access parts of me that never managed to be accessed till now or in a long time? So my blessing to you, I'm sorry for torturing you through that song, but my blessing to each and every one of us is that we manage to tap into our own rich inner world during this time. There is so much richness in our neshama, in our heart, in our emotions, in our memories, in our family traditions and who we are. And if we just tap into it, please God, we could then find inspiration to fight and enlighten another day. Shkoyach everybody.